And tonight, uh, I'm, I'm excited about the topic tonight because we're going to talk about biblical sexuality and transformation. And the big thing for me, you know, which came up last night too, is, you know, how much teaching do we have on this subject in, inside of our Christian world? You know, I mean, I wasn't taught anything at home and I was taught less <laughs> in uh, any kind of ministry training classes and stuff like that. And so you're just trying to figure this out. And, uh, you know, guessing isn't the greatest option. You know, if we can actually have some information on how to how to process, how to understand, how to go forward. And uh, the LGBT community does not have a monopoly on sexual brokenness. This is just a widespread issue all across uh, humanity. And uh, th that's just an obvious fact. And so we want to make sure that we can understand what is the mark we're shooting for and then talk about transformation. Because I do think that a lot of people get discouraged. They think, well, you know, these are just the thoughts I'm going to have and there's nothing I can do about it. And you just, you just think, well, my life is going to be a life of uh, resisting temptation and having a, you know, continual feeling of dissatisfaction. And that isn't the abundant life in Christ that we're going for. We want to be able to grab hold of the good things of God. And, and things can be long-term struggles and that sort of a deal. That's just part of the reality of it. Uh, but there is hope beyond that. So that's really uh, what I wanted to uh, have addressed. Uh, Drew will speak, and then we will open up question and answers uh, once we get going. You know, when, it, when Drew feels that it's the right time, then we'll start doing questions and answers, and Pastor Tom is going to run around with the microphone, and uh, people can ask questions and uh, right into the microphone, and then uh, we'll just go from there. So without any further ado, let us give a warm welcome to our favorite speaker tonight, Drew Berryessa. Well, good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, how many of you were not here last night? Oh, so how many of you who were not here last night have not heard me before? Oh, yes. All right. Well... Buckle up again. And for those who were here last night and came back, thank you. It is, uh, I've said it, I said it last night, I'll say it again. I know that there are a million different places we could all be tonight, and you've chosen to be here, you've chosen to listen, you've chosen to learn. And that is not only honoring to me, but it's incredibly encouraging to me. Uh, sexual brokenness, this, this, quest to understand what God's intention and purpose for sexuality is has been a lifelong journey for me. And for many of those first years of trying to find answers and going to the church and going to my pastors and going to leaders to try to find answers that would be powerful and helpful to me, running into time and time again, no answers and even being shut down and even being told like, stop asking. Um, it was super discouraging for someone who was sincerely looking for help. And, you know, back when I first began my own process of submitting my sexuality to Jesus, there wasn't a lot of help. And so to see this many people in a room in, you know, northern Minnesota, when you could be doing anything else, is not only so honoring for a speaker, but it's so encouraging because what this represents to me is that hopefully as you take the information you're given, you can ruminate on it and sift it and go to the Lord with it and make it part of what you believe and understand. And that means that this many people in this room will now be people that can help. If there's a teenager, if there's a kid, if there's a family member that doesn't know how to address this or doesn't know where to start, now all these people in this room have been told you've gotten some information. And instead of being like me back then, people will be able to have some answers and some hope. And so thank you, because what this represents to me, if, if young Drew were here right now, he would be crying because he knew and he felt like no one cared. And this room represents the fact that people care. So thank you. Thank you for that. That was a bit more emotional for me than I thought it was going to be. Okay. <sighs> okay, let's go. 
Um, tonight, we are going to talk about a theology of sexuality. And um, I've asked this in a couple of the other nights that we've been here, uh, made the point, and I don't know that we need to prove it again, but generally speaking, in the church, we have not received a lot of life-giving teaching on sexuality. Most of what we've been taught, in my experience and in most of the people that I've talked to over the years, we can sum up kind of the theme of what we've been taught in just like a couple words, like don't, or how dare, or bad, or, you know, any number of things. There's not a lot of life-giving teachings on sexuality. There's, it's mainly behavioral. And because of that, as a pastor, I have met with many young couples that have gotten married and many that, you know, like the unicorns that they are, remained absolutely sexually pure before marriage, walked into marriage believing that it was going to be, you know, great and wonderful. But because all they've ever been told about sex has a negative connotation, when they enter into that first night and, in, you know, experience marital union in that sexual act, end up walking out of that experience feeling guilty and shameful, even though there's nothing to feel bad about. Because it is a very weird gear shift to be told your entire life before marriage, don't, 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 don't sin, don't, don't, don't sin, go! Anyone relate to maybe that being a little bit of a hard gear shift? Anybody? Okay, uh, one, two, three. Now, for those who weren't here before, those who were, you know what I'm about to do, right? Okay. I have an agreement I make with my audiences, okay? Y'all ready for this? If I have to be up here sharing stories about my sexually broken history, including homosexuality, then if I ask you a benign question where I say, raise your hand if this benign thing happened to you and you sit there and stare at me, we're gonna have a problem. So can we agree that if I have to be up here doing this, you have to respond to me when I ask a question? Okay, that was a little enthusiastic. So I'm going to take it, and we'll see how you do in this. Theology of sexuality. Sexuality is not something that we talk about a lot in the church. Um, it's certainly, there's very little training in Bible colleges and seminaries uh, on this topic. So the reason why we don't talk a lot about it in church is because very few of our pastors are actually equipped well to talk about it in a way that makes them feel successful and like they can have something good to give. Instead, we default back often to the moralistic teachings, which they're right and they're good, but they're not complete. Right? Uh, I shared this um, a while back. I want to share this again. I uh, showed it in an abbreviated way. When we talk about sexuality, often we talk about um, two of three ethics that are important in understanding how things work. And uh, C.S. Lewis talks about this in Mere Christianity. He talks about a personal ethic, a social ethic, and an essential ethic. I shared this last night. If we put it as an example, uh, if we were to imagine a band of instruments and, and they're hired to play a tune. So a social ethic would be you all have to be in tune with one another and playing the same piece of music. You have to work well together. Uh, individual ethic or personal ethic would mean you have to make sure that you are ready to, to, you are where you're supposed to be, you're in your chair, your music's in front of you, your instrument individually is tuned. Does that make sense? Take care of yourself, interact with others well. When we look at how the church has responded to sexual teachings, we hear a lot of uh, teachings on what behavior is sinful. We, t we talk about our thought life, we talk about lust, we talk about um, accountability, we talk about what is the purpose uh, of marriage, you know, and procreation and unity and one flesh and one man, one woman. And we talk in all these very concrete terms, which are very much in those first two standards of social ethic and personal ethic. But what we miss often is the essential ethic, which is essentially why. Why is it one man and one woman? Why do we abstain from sexuality outside of marriage? Why did the Apostle Paul say that all other sins you commit outside your body, but sexual sin is different, not worse, different consequentially, because when you sin sexually, you sin against your own body. What does that mean? Why is it significant? And why is sexual theme 
including the marital analogy, one of the most consistent examples, illustrations, parables, however you want to put it, in all of scripture from the very first pages of Genesis all the way through to the very last pages of Revelation. If it is that consistently in the Bible over and over and over and over again, and I'll give you some examples in a few moments, then why are we not talking about it? Not talking about sexuality in the church has not made us holier. It has not made us healthier. It has not made us more relevant. It has not made us more spiritually mature. It has left us unprepared, ill-equipped, and pretty impotent to speak powerfully to a world who is constantly giving us purpose and meaning behind sex from their perspective. Make sense? Okay. So what we're going to do first and foremost tonight is I want to give you an overview of how we can begin to look at sexuality through a lens of purpose and meaning rather than just through a lens of rules. So where we're going to start is if you have a Bible or a device that you can pull up scripture on, please go to Genesis 1. Anytime that we talk about sexuality and what God's intention for sexuality is, we have to go back to Genesis. And the reason we have to go back to Genesis is because this is just a basic theological reality that we have to begin to apprehend. When humanity experienced the fall and that introduction of sin in our lives, the image and the intention and the purpose of what God intended for us relationally and, and communally and with him, it all got distorted and broken by the reality of sin. Do you agree? Everything that, that would have reflected the right image back then or an unobstructed view of, of what God's intentions are, is, will be, got distorted in a really powerful way once Adam and Eve chose to be disobedient to God. And when we look for a meaning and a purpose, we have to go back to the garden. We have to go back to what God intended from, you know, when we look at, at this kind of reality, there's this uh, dynamic that's, that's, that's always true. The intention or the purpose of a, of a thing will always inform the content or the substance of a thing. I'm going to say that again. Intent or purpose always informs and, and kind of establishes what the content and the substance of a thing is. So if you believe that your life is intended and intended by God, that the purpose of your life is to seek pleasure, which by the way, it is not. Can we agree to that? Okay. A little stiff as an audience tonight. So we're just going to, okay, I'm going to loosen you up for a minute because if we don't in this topic, we're going to die. Okay. So we're talking about sex tonight, yes? Okay. We are in a church sanctuary, yes? I need you to repeat a word after me. You ready? We're going to say a word that we don't normally say in a sanctuary, in God's temple, in the holy house of the Lord. Ready? Ready? Let's say the word penis. Can you say that? <laughs> Nobody said it but me. I'm feeling very alone. I'm feeling very, very um, not supported by you as an audience. So we're going to try this on the count of three. We're just going to get it out there. Not literally. We're going to get it figuratively out there. Okay. Nodding of heads, yes, all of you, nice Minnesota, nice people, getting ready to say a word we don't say in church. One, two, three. Yeah. I didn't say it. Did you notice? <laughs> no one got struck by lightning. No one is dead. God made our bodies. God made sexuality. He doesn't blush when we talk about sexuality. And just so that we can know that it's okay to even say that word in church, 
let me just ask you about this clever idea that God had, God's idea. How did God choose to ask the men of his people to be identified as the men of his people in the Old Testament? Circumcision. Very odd way to check ID. I'm going to have to ask the Lord about that in glory. Are you one of my people? Woo! You know, it's like, I don't... I don't know the spiritual significance of that, and I'm not going to wager a guess, but we're going to, we're going, are we loosened up now? Yes. I wasn't convinced by that. Are we loosened up now? Yes. Okay, now I won't make you say boobies. So <laughs> let's talk about something that begins to establish our basis for understanding a theology of the purpose of sexuality. But I have to get you on board and agree with me on a few things. So let's, let's do this. In the book of Romans, it says that God's invisible attributes are on display throughout all of creation. And God does this so that no one is with, without, no one has an excuse to acknowledge the presence of the Almighty God. Because in the mountains and in the trees and in nature and throughout all creation, God is showing the na his nature, his attributes. This is what the word of God says. Can we agree to that? So God likes to teach us and show us things through parable, which parable is like a story that's pointing to a spiritual reality. Listen to the Chasing Squirrels podcast. We talk all about these parables. But essentially what it's doing is it's using a tangible thing to try to, try to teach us about something that's a little bit harder to understand. So when Jesus did this with the parables, he was teaching us about the kingdom of God. So he used physical examples that we could relate to, to understand the immaterial, the spiritual, the heavenly, because that's how he works. In creation, he's got his attributes on display in the physical so that we begin to understand his nature, which is spiritual, because we can't see him, but we can see creation. Yes? yes. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says this, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. One thing to note, the word man there in the Hebrew is, uh, man is often Adam, which we get Adam. But this particular word can describe man, singular, or it can stand for mankind. And in this particular part of the passage, it's saying, let us make mankind in our image after our likeness. This is why it says, let them, mankind, have dominion over all the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and all over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, Adam, male and female, he created them. So if we see that God has put and painted in creation, all of creation, his attributes so that we can see and understand and begin to understand him by looking at the mountains and the trees and the stars in the sky and the rivers and all the things that God has given us to show clues about his attributes, how much more do we display a clearer picture of him if that, he says, shows attributes. Us, he says, bear his image. Now, male and female created in his image to display his image. Let me ask you this question. Are men and women different? Oh, that was not nearly as enthusiastic of an answer. So I'm going to ask again. Are men and women different? Yes. We know that they're different. We know that they are emotionally different. They're physically different. They, they, they've got differences up the wazoo. How many of you ever have seen the little skit, It's Not About the Nail? Anyone? Yes. If you've seen it, you know this is displaying in a kind of caricature some of the differences relationally between men and women. And it's funny and it paints a picture. But when we see this, we know that male and female are different. We know bodily that we're different and we bear God's image. Let me ask you this question. Does God have a body? 
No, God is spirit. So we know that bodily, we, it's not that, you know, my body as a man is what I will see when I see God. My body instead, just like a woman's body created in the image of God, is parable. Another way to look at it, and we don't use this word in Protestant church all that often, is sacrament. Now, in the Catholic church, they've got like seven or eight or nine or ten. I don't even know how many sacraments they have. In the Protestant church, which we consider like only a few, like a baptism and communion as sacrament. And I think there's maybe one other thing I can't even remember. But even that is not based on the literal definition of the word sacrament. Sacrament simply means this a physical, tangible thing that reveals a divine, eternal truth. I want to say that again. A physical, tangible thing that reveals a divine, spiritual truth. So our bodies, created in the image of God, male and female, different, co-equal, both display the image of God equally, but differently, and we know that the differences in our physical body is our gender, right? So what does our gender reveal about the nature of God? Because if we are to understand the purpose of sexuality, we can never separate it out from our biological gender. We can never separate it out from the reality that we are created different in his image. There's purpose and meaning behind that. One of the things we have to also understand is that when we go to Genesis 2, we see the recounting a little bit uh, different, more detailed explanation of the creation of man. And we see that Adam created first mankind, which is, can get a little trippy because it, mankind created first in a singular Adam. And as God is parading all of creation in front of Adam to name the animals and to, to find a suitable helper. In all creation, there is no suitable helper. There's no counterpart to Adam. And this is not good. It's the only thing in all creation, in the, the creation narrative that God looked at and said, this isn't good. He needs, he needs a helpmate. And so that we understand that word in the Hebrew for helper, Ezra, is actually used so many times in the scripture to describe the Holy Spirit or God himself. So ladies, I want you to hear that because sometimes in Christian culture, we, we look at helpmate and it has this connotation of like less than or servitude or subservience. That word for helpmate is never used to describe that. In fact, we would never look at God and say, you're less than or you're subservient. You're just here to help me. No, God is powerful. God is strong. God is showing up in power to help us. Just like when the Holy Spirit came, when Jesus said, I'm going to send you the helper, the, the same, same root word of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit's presence in your life is actually better for you than Jesus physically here. Same word. So I want ladies to give you that so that you can understand that in this culture that often tries to diminish who you are, your value and your status as an image bearer of God, you carry power. You carry a very powerful reflection of God in who you are as a woman. And do not let any old fool tell you anything different. Okay? You might tell, I'm the father to daughters. <laughs> it's been very important to me to get this point right. But in Genesis 2, when we see this more detailed description of the creation of male and female, and Adam, mankind, alone, is not good, what does God do? He puts him under a sleep, and in the, the translation of the scriptures, it often says, he takes one of his ribs, right? Again, the word in the scripture, in the Hebrew, that's often given to us as rib, is not actually rib. It is in every other instance in the Old Testament used to describe one half of sacred architecture. So like the side of the temple, the side of the Ark of the Covenant, the half of the tabernacle, like the altar of, you know, it, it's describing something 
that has great spiritual sacred significance and meaning that it is a, a half or a one side of two dimensions of that particular sacred architecture. So literally what this is saying is that in this moment, God took the one and he divided it in two. So this would display one half and this would display another half. Equal halves of the image of God, different, equal, all God's image. And again, in the parable of our body, to show us and to teach us and to help give us clue as to the nature of God relationally, not physically, the, the shape of God's soul, of his presence, of his personality on display as parable or sacrament in our bodies, in our gender. You tracking with me so far? Okay, so let's talk about the two words that describe male and female in the Hebrew, because words matter, yeah? Yes. Do we agree that God is the most intentional being in all of creation in the cosmos? Yes. So he doesn't waste anything, everything he does is intentional? Yes. So the very words he calls male and female have meaning too. So, how many of you here speak Hebrew? Good. Because <laughs> when I pronounce these words with authority, you'll believe me because you don't know. So uh, the Hebrew word for female in the scripture, and I'll probably not pronounce this perfectly, but I'll, it's, you'll go with it, nekaba. And nekaba in the Hebrew has this meaning. You ready for the divine mystery, ladies? What God is revealing in the word nekaba for female? It means board open, or pierced, or perforated, or punctured, open. Do you know what the Hebrew word for male means? The Hebrew word is zakar. It means pointed. <laughs> for a word picture, Baby shark, do 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 do. Baby shark, do 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 do. Baby shark, do 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 do. Do you see what? I, do you see? Some of you just look like deer in the headlights right now, and I know why, and I can relate why this fool is doing this right here in front of you. But do you see what I'm doing here? Do I need to articulate very specifically what this is illustrating here? No. We understand what this is illustrating here, what this is describing. The word for male is describing, and often, honestly, in Islamic culture, the word zakar means penis. The word nekabah means opened up, and we see that God is pointing once again to the gendered selves of the female and the male. And he's pointing to this parable of saying something about female is represented, something about the shape of a female soul, something about biblical femininity you can understand and discover by virtue of the parable of the female body. Something about the male soul, about biblical masculinity about the, the thing that men are called to, the, the identity that they are called to, the way they display the image of God is revealed in the parable of a man's body. Now, I'm not gonna make you guess of what these parables mean because no. But I'm going to begin to tell you what I believe God is trying to reveal through this. Because God, again, he is, he is spirit, he is not flesh. He's pointing to a reality that we can begin to understand, not in the, that God is not embodied like that, but God is relational in nature. God relates as the core of his being. And when he's showing us this in male and female and the way that male and female interact with one another in the covenant of marriage and what the act of sex actually communicates about the image of God, 
is incredibly important for us as, the, as believers to understand. Because right now, as it stands, we have all the morals, we have all the do's and don'ts, but we don't have a meaning or a purpose, something that tells us something bigger than don't as to why this is important. And we crave meaning, don't we? How many of you are parents in the room? Raise your hand. How many of you have ever uttered the words to your children in pure exasperation, because I said so? How many of you, how many of you in the room are children? Well, yeah, I see you. You're like, I'm kind of a man, but I'm also their child. How many of you have heard the words, because I said so? How many of you have thought when your parents said those words, that's a cop-out, I want an answer? Essentially, what we've done in the church is we've, we've gone to, because I said so, for our sexuality teaching. And, and we can't do that because, like I said, we crave meaning. And Proverbs 27, 7, for those who've been around this, this week and heard me speak, you've heard me say this. This has so many applications. Proverbs 27, 7 says this, to him who is well-fed, honey is not desirable or sweet, but to him who is starving, the bitter thing will seem to taste sweet, which essentially means bad love is better than no love at all. It essentially means that in the absence of something, the wrong thing seems like the right thing. Because in physics, a vacuum does not want to stay empty. It wants to get filled Emotionally and relationally, we don't like a vacuum. If we have a need for love and it's not being met, we want to fill it. Physically, if we are hungry for food and we're not eating, we want to fill it. Yeah? We also exist like this for meaning and purpose. And if the church does not give us meaning and purpose behind sexuality, but only empty rules or moralistic rules, but the culture is telling us all day long that there are greater meanings and purposes for sexuality, who's going to win? Culture. Because it is a better story to pursue something for personal fulfillment or, you know, achieving, you, you know, uh, so many of the other things, like uh, a sense of identity or a sense of community or connection or pleasure. These are better things better ideas, better purposes than don't, right? So let's, let's get to the purpose of this a little bit and, and the shape of our bodies and how they reveal the image of God, his masculine attributes and his feminine attributes. So let's start with ladies first because I'm a gentleman. Oh, I didn't realize you were gonna laugh at that, okay? <laughs> Thought it was just like, yes, you are, Drew. Thank you. Thank you. You're my new favorite. Okay, so what we, what we recognize here is, and I know this might get uncomfortable for just a minute, but if you haven't noticed this already, I steer into the skid of awkward all the time. That's what we're going to do. We're going to describe the sexual act here for just a second because, again, it displays the nature of God. When a man and a wife in covenantal commitment, blessed by God, come together and become one flesh, the man enters the woman because she is open to receive him. Correct? Correct. Correct. And because this is within God's will, it is pleasurable. It is productive. It can bring forth children and new life. It, sex and the sexual act has incredible power to both be life-giving and affirming and encouraging and wonderful if it's in the right context. And sex has the power to be destructive and painful and life-altering and destroying in the wrong context. Correct? This is one of the reasons why the Apostle Paul says, all other sins you commit outside of your body, but sexual sin, when you commit it, you commit it against your own body because the consequences to sexual sin are very different than other sins. For example, if I steal a cookie out of the cookie jar, how do I make that right? Now, I'm an authority on this, as you might tell. How do you make that right? Anyone know how you make that right? What? Well, bake a new cookie 
Or if you're not a baker, buy a new cookie. Or if you have no money, apologize for stealing the cookie. You know, on the grand scheme and scale, your parent or your wife, my wife, might say, don't, you know, that's wrong. You're going to, you know, gain weight. But I forgive you, you know, and you move on. It's not a big deal. But if I sexually abuse my daughter, I can't undo that. If I have sex outside of marriage and I get a woman pregnant and we create an eternal being, I can't undo that. And if we want to go into this, you know, the conversation about abortion, which please let me, please, please hear this. If you are in this room and you have made sexual mistakes and in your desperation and in your circumstance, the way you tried to deal with it was to either have an abortion or encourage the woman you got pregnant to have an abortion. Can I tell you that if you will confess that to the Lord, if you have confessed that to the Lord, he's forgiven you. It is incredibly painful. It's incredibly sad. And you did not do that in a vacuum. And the consequences of the guilt and the sadness and the shame, no matter how forgiven you are, it lasts a long time. You don't just say you're sorry and move on from that. It has great consequence. Rape has consequence. Human trafficking has consequence. Pornography has consequence. Sexual sin has incredible consequences. For giggles and grins, let's just imagine a minute a world where we, all of humanity simply obeyed God in just the one area of sex, how much different would our world be? Massively improved. Massively improved. I mean, let's, let's go down the short list. Well, right now, over 40 million Americans visit porn sites regularly. Pornography, we know, destroys Marriages, it, it, it defiles our conscience. It exploits the people that are in it. It's terrible. We also know that there are around 42 million porn websites. 42 million. And around 370 million pages of porn on the internet. The porn industry's annual revenue is more than the NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball combined. It is also more than the combined revenues of ABC, CBS, and NBC. 47% of families in the United States reported that pornography is a problem in their home. Just about half. And those are just the ones reporting it. Pornography use increases the marital infidelity rate by more than 300%. 11 years old is the average age that a child is first exposed to pornography. And 94% of children will see porn by the age 14. 56% of American divorces involve one party having an obsessive interest in pornography. 70% of Christian youth pastors report that they have had at least one teen come to them in the last week asking for help dealing with porn. 68% of church-going men and over 50% of pastors view porn on a regular basis. Of young Christian adults, 18 through 24 years old, 76% actively search for porn. 59% of pastors said that married men seek their help for porn use. 33% of women aged 25 and under search for porn at least once per month. 13% of self-identified Christian women say they've never seen porn. 87% of Christian women have watched it. Now, this is just pornography. But what about sexually transmitted diseases? What about rape? What about human trafficking? What about abortion? What about infidelity, sexual abuse? What about eating disorders? 
our culture is so sexualized and has so sexualized our bodies and the aesthetic perfection of bodies that there are girls and guys now, increasingly so. Do you know that eating disorders for young men have increased over 400% in the last 10 years? Because when young men and women look at their bodies in a culture like ours that is increasingly pornographic and it doesn't resemble the perfection that is often displayed in pornography, such self-hatred and body dysmorphia begins to arise and erupt and you begin to kill yourself through food to try to achieve that perfect body because we have a hypersexualized culture. There have been wars started because of sex, which means there have been people who have been killed because of sex. That's a lot of issues, isn't it? Now imagine a world without the economic, social, medical, emotional, psychological, spiritual problems and consequences that come with sexual sin. Imagine a world without any of that. Sexual sin is different. It's different than other sins. It, it carries different weight. And main reason for that is because our sexuality has such incredible, incredible meaning. Before I get into the whole like extrapolation of the image of God in male and female, which I was about to do, I want to say this before I say that. How many of you have read the Genesis account of the fall of mankind? Raise your hand if you've read it. What is the first consequence of the fall? Anyone remember from the narrative? Come on, class, speak up. They realized they were naked and they were ashamed. And so what did they do? They covered it up. Do you realize that the first consequence of the fall of mankind was sexual in nature? That once they realize and begin to be ashamed of their physical bodies, the very way that they display the nature of God as parable and sacrament in their gender, that very way they do that, the gift that God has given us to understand his nature through our own bodies, through our own gender, through our own masculinity and femininity, the enemy convinced them was bad, so they covered it up. And the enemy has been distorting the image of God in male and female ever since. J.R.R. Tolkien, wrote Lord of the Rings, wrote in a letter to his son, who was about to get married, that in his estimation, broken sexuality was the chief symptom of the fall of mankind, and it was Satan's favorite playground. So what I'm about to tell you is very consequential. It's very important because this area in our culture is destroying people and it is distorting the image of God on display in our world. It has multiple consequences and our ability to understand it and to begin to apprehend the meaning of this and to live in the power of what this is actually has incredible power to transform our world. I hope you'll see that as we talk about it. So ladies first, female, Nekaba, opened up. In the sexual act, a woman receives a man, and obviously if this is a procreative act, the man implants the woman with the seed, semen, she conceives, that's how life comes out. Jesus ties spiritual themes in the New Testament to this very reality. I want to point out a couple of them to you. When Jesus confronted the Pharisees, he said, your attempts at righteousness are like filthy rags. The literal translation of filthy rags in the Greek is menstrual cloth. Jesus didn't blush when he said it, and he was, in, he was intentional when he said it. What do we know to be true about a woman when she's having her period? She's not pregnant. Quite you know, literally, we know she's not pregnant. But what that represents in this statement that Jesus was making to the Pharisees is this. Your attempt to be righteous only shows me that you have no life of God in you. There is no life of God birthed, growing, 
in or maturing in you, you are dead on the inside. And he followed up the statement of filthy rags with this statement so that they didn't miss it. You're like a whitewashed tomb, pristine and clean on the outside, but rotting and dead on the inside. Because that pregnancy, the act of sex, implanting life into the woman, this is reflective of spiritual life and birth. When Jesus, when, when we come to faith in Jesus, what do we say that we do? We what? We receive him into our hearts, right? And we receive the Holy Spirit in. And we, as the bride of Christ, reflecting the feminine attributes of God as his bride, are open up to receive him and nourish the life that he implants in us. This is the process of sanctification, discipleship, and growing into the image of God from glory to glory. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again, and Nicodemus, not getting that he was talking in parable, said, how am I supposed to crawl back up into my mother? And every lady in here said, please don't try to do that. And Jesus said, don't do that. Like, this is an illustration, Nicodemus. No, he said, I'm talking about being born of spirit. We know, once again, as we're dissecting this, that God has used this as an example in a parable. When Paul, in Ephesians 5, brings up, and he's talking about marriage, he quotes Genesis 1 and 2. He quotes that for this very reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be united together with his wife in one flesh. And he follows it up saying, this is a profound mystery. And I'm saying it refers to Christ in his church. This act of marital union, that in femininity and in the creation of female to display the image of God, what we see is that Christ is implanting life in the church and he is causing it to grow. This is our spiritual birth. And your bodies, ladies, are displaying the spiritual reality. Now, the reason why is, and what this reflects, is the invitational nature of God. God is invitational. God is welcoming us into his family. God is calling us to respond to him. In Revelation, it says, the spirit and the bride say, come. It's invitational. Come and be nourished. Come and be fed. Come receive water. Come and be ministered to. Because the spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, ladies, you need to hear this. The Holy Spirit actually displays the feminine characteristics of God in the Trinity pretty powerfully. Often in the scriptures, when we see God referred to, it's in the Psalms and the Proverbs that we often see the feminine attributes of God come and be displayed in the scriptures because the spirit of wisdom, which is often referred to by the Holy Spirit, is referred to in the feminine. When we see God talking about being, you know, a mother hen who is covering us and gathering us under his wing, this is the idea of containment and, and uh, embrace and invitation that is displayed in femininity. Biblical femininity. Moms in the room, how many of you have ever been in a grocery store and one of your kids have thrown a fit? If you want to look at the kid that did that and give them a little bit of a guilt right now, you can't, I mean, it would be reasonable. How do you feel when that's happening? Embarrassed, right? You feel like, oh, this kid, oh, uh, Why? And in our humanity, and I know as a father when this happens, I'm like, nope, you know, it's like, this is, this is not what we want. But when a mom is healthy and secure in her femininity, when she is displaying femininity that God has ordained to reveal his image, she has this amazing ability, sometimes way better than dad's, to display something that psychologists call containment. And it's literally when a kid is kicking off, we understand this is an immature kid. And sometimes the kid is kicking off because they're being a brat, right? And sometimes they're kicking off because we forgot to feed them. Any parent ever forget to feed your kid and be like, oh, they're hangry now. <laughs> How many of you know this? Like you're going to the store, you can see the signs that this is not going to go well for you. Yes? A secure mom who is displaying the femininity that reflects the image of God 
has this ability in the security of who she is when that kid is throwing a fit to get down on her knees and put her arms around that kid and go, shh, you're okay. You're fine. It's going to be okay. That mom, when she does that, she's not feeling insecure because whatever that kid is doing is not about her. It doesn't affect her identity. It doesn't affect her value. She's not threatened by, by this little toddler monster. She's just doing what she knows to do and wrapping her arms around that kid and saying, shh, you're okay. Husbands, dads in the room, have you seen your wives do this? Have you seen your husband do that? Good for him. Husbands, you've not seen this? Thank you, Mike. Trinette, thank you. Other husbands in the room, have you ever seen your wife just hold a child and calm them? Okay, men, this is participate. I'm on my knees. I'm begging you to participate in this moment. Literally on my knees. I've watched my wife do this 9,000 times with our kids. And it, I marvel at it every time because my emotional reaction in the store is I'm embarrassed. I think this is reflecting on my parenthood. She doesn't care. She sees a child that is acting out and she sees a child that is emotional and she recognizes I have the opportunity here to display the nature of God because if you have ever experienced this dynamic, you can read the Psalms and you can see David throwing a giant fit in a cave or a giant fit in a field or a giant fit in the palace or anywhere he threw a giant fit. And it looks a lot like, God, why have you forsaken me? Why did the enemies of my soul prosper? Why are these wicked men, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's all this accusation against God. It's basically a, a hissy fit. And somewhere in the middle of that Psalm, you see his emotions begin to shift and change. But I find shelter under the cover of your wings. But you are my strong tower and I rush to you and I am saved. Containment. God, in his feminine attributes, just like a strong, good, secure mom saying, you're okay. Your emotions are not too big for me. Your accusations are not too big for me. Your disobedience is not too big for me. This is why God takes us just as we are. You ever heard the statement, a face only a mother could love? <laughs> yes. Yes, we have. Moms have this ability because they display the character of God to look beyond the external and to minister to the needs emotionally and to cover that kid and to contain them. Isn't that awesome? And it displays the image of God in a powerful way. The invitational nature of women, this is so incredibly life-giving. But I'm gonna tell you the truth. If ladies in the room, if you're seeing this and going invitational, I don't wanna be invitational. The number one symptom of broken femininity that I see in this world is being closed off and shut down. Ladies in the room, how challenging are female friendships for you sometimes? Right, because in our brokenness and in the fall of our, of our nature, instead of being open to receive and secure and able to contain, we feel threatened and insecure. There's competition, there's cattiness, there's, there's jealousy, and you're not open. Instead, you're much more closed and shut down. And this is a reflection of the fall. This is the, the, the relational way of putting the fig leaf over your genitals because you're no longer displaying that invitational nature of God. Let's get to men. Men, we know that we are different. Yes? Do we like to listen to a lot of problems or do we like to fix problems? Yes. I struggled with homosexuality. I didn't realize I was a good man for a long time. I thought I was more like a woman. I'll be honest with you, if I had struggled, if, my, if I had been a teenager now, in this day and age, I probably would have been transgender. This is m what my life would have been because I so incredibly felt like I failed as a man culturally. Honestly, because one of the barriers we had to get over is that the church t takes 
cultural ideas of masculinity and femininity and superimpose them over the Bible and say, this is what biblical masculinity and femininity is. No, ladies, your invitational nature does not mean that you are Martha Stewart. And you don't have to be. She went to prison. <laughs> Let's pick a better example. You do not have to be Joanna Gaines. Do you know who that is? Yes, everybody? Okay. You can display your invitational nature in a way that is unique to your personality and your gifting and your temperament. In my hometown, there are two women that go to my church. They're amazing. Their names are Lou Crenshaw and Chantel Dayton. Lou Crenshaw was the first person to open a CrossFit gym in all of Oregon. And it is Oregon, not Oregon, so that you know Midwest. And Chantel Dayton is like a 18 level black belt. I don't even know what that is, but I do know that she has Chuck Norris on her speed dial because she trained with him. Y'all, I know someone who has Chuck Norris on speed dial. Now, these are not typically feminine things to be able to break you in half with your pinky finger or to lift very large tires and throw them across the room. These two women are very athletic, they're very strong, they're very direct, they are amazing women. And they have created a gym in our town for women that combine exercise with discipleship and dealing with and removing trauma and illness from the body by activating God's design in us with our nervous system, our body and movement. And they are not only leading women into greater health, emotionally and physically and spiritually, they're leading women to Jesus covertly without them even knowing through this CrossFit gym where they are teaching them how to heal their lives. And they are creating an environment where women feel safe and they feel known and they feel loved and they can heal. That's invitational, even if it's CrossFit and Kung Fu. Does that make sense? So men, well, we're to you. Zakar, penis, pointy. You want to solve some problems. You want to get in there, literally. Get in there. What this reveals is the incarnational nature of God, of his personality. And the member of the Trinity that displays this clearly is Jesus. Because Jesus put on flesh and entered into our world. He came down and emptied himself of divinity to enter into our world, to bring the gospel to us, to remember the covenants that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to come and to make things right. He stepped into disorder to bring order because incarnational movement and, and reality is biblical masculinity which is why the most common symptom of broken masculinity in our culture is passivity. Men in the room, have you struggled with passivity? Exhibit A, you're not even answering. I mean, not to pick on you, but you're not even answering. And it's not because this isn't a safe place to answer. We said penis several times. We're okay. But do you sometimes, and maybe, okay, since you're not answering, we'll just say that you're here for your friend to understand these things and give these things to your friends who are not struggling with anything. But men in the room, have you seen men who instead of stepping in, have stepped back? Have you seen men that when their families are falling apart, they sit and watch TV or immerse themselves in their work or in their hobby and they check out? Yes or no, have you seen it? Thank you. Because when humanity fell, that incarnational drive, that drive that we see comically in it's not about the nail because the woman wants to invite the man into her process, invitational, and the man wants to step in and fix it, right? 
It resonates with us. It has nothing to do with sports. It has nothing to do with building things. It has nothing to do with so many of the cultural things that we superimpose over the Bible and call masculinity. It has to do with incarnation and movement. That as a man, I move into the disorder and I bring the presence of God and I bring revelation of God and I remember what he's done for me and I bring it to the chaos and I do my level best to represent the presence of God in the middle of the mess, right? When I was, it was only about six or seven years ago that I first began to learn this aspect of biblical masculinity and femininity. And I'll be honest with you, I was on a trip to Kansas City from Oregon to go speak to a church. And I was reading a book, this, there's, this is all, a lot of this is in a book by Dr. Larry Crabb called Fully Alive, The Image of God in Male and Female. And I was on a plane I'm going to say it was Southwest. Seems ghetto enough for a Southwest. I was crammed into a corner in this plane. I was reading this book and I was wrestling with the concept of masculinity because even though I was a husband and a father at this point, and even though my name is Andrew, which literally means strong and manly. <laughs> so funny. Why are you laughing? That's rude. Just kidding. I still was believing some pretty, pretty awful things about the quality of man that I was because I had never been taught anything about masculinity other than cultural masculinity. And when I begin to read this and the, uh, that God displays his nature through men, through incarnational movement, the Lord began to reveal to me all the ways that I do that. Now you can look at me right now, you understand I am short, I'm a little squishy around the edges, I get this. I just grew into my ears last week. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> I'm fuzzy headed. I'm dramatic, I'm emotional. I'm kind of a hobbit, let's face it. Like this is what I look like, this is who I am. But do we believe that God creates each of us on purpose for purpose? Yes. Yeah. Every bit of your personality, every bit of, of who you are, God, gave you good gifts because he has a mission and an assignment and a destiny for us. And no matter what your struggle might be, if you're in here and you've struggled with your gender, God made you on purpose for purpose. And I relate to that struggle and being a young man struggling with my gender and struggling with my sexuality and thinking I wasn't a good man. And then when the Lord began showing me these things, this is what he said to me. He said, Drew, people tell you secrets all the time. I sit with people as a pastoral counselor who have been through sexual assault and defilement. People have been through trauma and divorce and abandonment and rejection. People have been called horrible things. People have lived through some of the worst circumstances. And people tell me all of it because I am safe. Because I'm not threatening to them. Because my very presence carries this permission of like, you can tell him everything. Why? because you trust hobbits with rings of power. That's why. I am dramatic, I'm loud. I'm, I'm, you know, obnoxious. I'm also a public speaker. I can hold your attention. The reason I can do that is I'm dramatic and emotional and creative and loud. I am sensitive and I'm artistic. You know what? That's really helpful being the father of three daughters. Because if I wasn't, I would be pretty tone deaf to their hearts. I'd be pretty insecure in my own responses if I can't engage with emotion. I shared this last night for those of you who weren't here. My wife played a dirty trick on me twice. Some of you know what I'm, where I'm going with this. I have, a four, uh, I have a almost 16 year old daughter, an almost 14 year old daughter and an almost nine year old daughter. The almost 16 and almost 14 year old daughters. My wife went on a ladies trip two times. Both the day before each of these two daughters had their first period. <laughs> and I said to her before she left, she crazy. I think she's gonna have her period. And my wife said, no, she's not, you're fine. And then she left. 
And then not 24 hours later, my oldest daughter comes to me. Dad, yes, I'm bleeding. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and I told this story last night. Okay, go get the supplies. Do you know where they are? Yes, mother told me. Go and retrieve them. Gets the supplies. Dad, I don't know how to use this. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't have a lot of experience with it either, but I can read. So let's read the instructions, okay? Get an extra pair of underwear. We'll do a display. We'll have an extra one. You put it in there like this. You stick it down on that like that. You pull them up and you're golden, right? Okay, good. I'm going to leave the bathroom. I'm going to stand outside. If you need anything, don't ask, but I'm here and I'm for you, I'll root you on, I'm behind the door. She closes the door, okay, Dad, we've got this. Closes the door, rustle, rustle, rustle. Why does this feel like a diaper? Well, I don't know, baby girl, but welcome to womanhood. Yep. yep. And she goes, well, whoop-de-doo for me. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> rustle, 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 opens the door, she looks at me, she goes, Dad, we did it. I said, Yes, we did. And she goes, Pat, 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 you did good. And off she went. And then I passed out. Um, two years later, same scenario. Wife's going on a trip. I said, if you go on this trip and Olivia has her period while you're gone, you owe me. She's like, it's not going to happen twice. The only two times in her life my wife has been wrong. Same sort of scenario. We worked it out. Do you know how helpful it is that my daughters feel so safe with me, with their hearts and with their emotions, that they can say anything to me, they can deal with anything with me. They can come to me with any of their hurts, any of their struggles, any of their information, and they know that I'm safe. Do you know that when God made me, he knew the girls he was gonna give me, and he made me on purpose for purpose. I'm not physically intimidating. People are not afraid to tell me things. For a lot of my years of ministry, I looked at that as feminine. I can, I can engage with you emotionally. No, that's not what's happening. It is what's happening, but it's happening through the lens of stepping into the pain and the chaos and bringing the presence of God incarnationally to pain and wound and need and helping bringing order to chaos in the hearts and the minds of the people that God has given me the privilege to minister to. My Lord, when I read the definition in that plane, that that is what masculinity is, I was like, well, holy crap, I'm a man in the plane. I don't have an inner voice. Thank you. When... When God gives us this, when he gives us our masculinity and femininity, and he points to the relational nature of God displayed in our gender, and he gives us the assignment as men and women to display his nature through our gender, it's like the manifold grace of God because there's all these different types of men. Well, that's good because God has a lot of different attributes. And the men that I get to serve in my church back home, our sheriff goes to our church. I love that guy. We are very different, as you might imagine. Can you imagine me as a sheriff? <laughs> Stop or I'll shoot. I'll shoot. You know, it, it'll be, it would be very theatrical. He displays masculinity very differently than me, but he displays it on purpose for a purpose. We have therapists and doctors and U.S. marshals and, you know, software engineers and all these incredibly different, unique men, musicians, and, and they all display God's character differently, just like the different types of women that we have that all display the image of God differently, but invitationally and incarnationally. And if you aren't resonating with that particular description in your own gender, don't worry because we all get to display these attributes because guess what? Guys, brace yourself. We're all the bride of Christ. And ladies, we're all the body of Christ. 
We all display invitational and incarnational when we fulfill those roles as his hands and feet. When God says, go and make disciples of all nations, that is incarnational. Get out there and go. When it talks about discipleship and raising up and caring for new believers and the nourishment of the church and these, these issues that bring community together and when we're being the bride of Christ, we're displaying the invitational nature of God. When we as as the body of Christ get to see someone come into church and begin to experience the life of Christ, we get to display both. Does this make sense? Is this a better story than don't? Let's go one step further. In marriage, why did God purpose male and female united together in one flesh? Why? Because as we raise children and bring them up, this is just for those of us who have the children and get married. When we display the intention of God through that, what we're giving to our children, even if it is through a glass darkly, we are giving a complete image of God in his nature with mom and dad. When we don't have mom and dad, we have a distorted image. And I'm not saying that to shame anybody. I'm saying that to say that God has purposed his complete image to come together in a powerful way in that relational nature. And we get to display a full image of God so that our kids can understand the God who is pursuing them because they can see his attributes in the mom and the dad that are raising him. Now, how many of you moms and dads feel a little bit inadequate to that calling? If you are not raising your hand, then I am impressed with you. Or I am suspect of you. I'm not going to tell you which one. But we have this privilege of displaying a more complete picture of the nature of God. And we have this privilege doing this as the crown of his creation those that bear his image. And if you don't get married and if you're single your whole life, you still get to display this image because you are the bride of Christ and God is your spouse. And how we interact in that surrendered relationship to God displays those same things too. Amen? And as the believer in Jesus who goes missionally out, we're displaying the masculine as the body, as the bride of Christ, who is welcoming those in, we're displaying the feminine attributes of God and God's character is on display for the world to see, which makes total sense why this world and marriage, marriages in this world are under such attack. Gender in this world is under such attack because Satan does not want our world to see God clearly. Because the purpose of sexuality and the purpose of our gender is not pleasure. Although we get pleasure from it because God is a good God. It is not physical procreation, although God accomplishes that through it. And it does serve a good purpose. It's not the why. It is not so that we're not lonely. We have relational connection with the spirit of God and we have it with our brothers and sisters in Christ. When God said it's not good for man to be alone, it didn't necessarily mean that to fulfill mankind and their ultimate purpose, they had to have sex and be married. We just needed people to partner with. But the highest value, the why behind our sexuality and our gender is to display God. Is that a more powerful story? See, the thing that's one of the things I've learned in ministry is that pursuit is way more powerful than resistance. Let me, let me contextualize that. If there is a sin that you're struggling with, if you're just standing in one place and you're like, I don't want to do it, 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 you're going to do it. Because you're trying to resist against a force that's coming at you. But what if you are so captured by a vision of something that's good and worth pursuing 
that you're not standing still trying to resist temptation. You're pursuing a better thing. There was a Scottish theologian back in the 1700s named Thomas Chalmers, and he wrote this huge essay that said, it was basically called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. Basically meaning that if we have a bad habit or or addiction or some besetting sin in our lives, it's not enough just to try to get rid of it because it won't work because we get rid of it. There's a vacuum. A vacuum doesn't want to stay empty. Something else will fill it, right? When Jesus said, if you cast out a demon and if you don't close that soul up and clean it up, what's going to happen? It's going to go out and get seven of its ugliest friends and come back. This is the Drew translation of the Bible. A vacuum won't stay empty. But if you cast a demon out of a person and that person gets filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with the things of God and they pursue relationship with God and pursue discipleship, that thing is not going to come back in. If you have an addiction and you say, you know what, I do want this, but what I want more than that is purity and intimacy with Christ. And you say, rather than indulging my flesh, I'm going to run fast and furious towards Jesus. Pursuit is more powerful than resistance. And church, we've been resisting sexual brokenness and we have not been pursuing a purpose of sexuality that is better than don't. So we've been weak. Would you agree? I'm not going to take the time to read all the scriptures that kind of confirm this reality that God is displaying his nature and his covenantal relationship with us, but it's, so, it's all throughout the Bible. And if we understand this to be the very nature of what God is trying to display, can I say this? Biblical masculinity, men, you already have everything you need to be the best man that God has intended you to be because whatever you feel like you failed in, I would venture a guess that the measuring rod that you're looking at as pass or fail is cultural and not biblical. You have everything you need to be exactly the man that God has called you to be. Pursue it. Cast off passivity and engage because the world needs your presence. Whether you feel equipped or mature enough or good enough, you are called and equipped by the very virtue of the fact that God made you a man. Go display his image. Ladies in the room, you are not disqualified. You are not less than. You are not second rate. You display attributes of God that are powerful and transformative and our world needs. And it is tempting in our world with how much your femininity, the very beauty and nature of God that he gave you to display him, has made many of you vulnerable to abuse, to defilement, to judgment, to violence, to ridicule, right? None of that diminishes or defines your value as a woman. The messages that the enemy has been trying to give you have been trying to convince you you're weak, you are strong. And the world needs women that will rise up in their identity and bear the image of God and display the invitational, caring, containing, nurturing nature of a God who wants to receive anyone who will, re- who will receive him. Ladies, that is your calling. And you have everything you need to do it perfectly, beautifully, and powerfully. You are good enough. Amen. Can, can we pursue that? Yes. Thank you. So in this theology of sexuality, again, it doesn't answer every question, but it gives us a starting point. It gives us a, a starting point and a new lens to view gender, marriage, and sexuality. Correct? I want to challenge you all to go to the word of God and start looking at these attributes displayed by God and by his people. I want you to start seeing the way that biblical characters, men and women in the Bible display these things, the nature of 
invitational and containing and strong. Perfect example, Mary. She received the life of God bravely in a culture that very likely was going to kill her for being pregnant outside of wedlock. She was 14 years old and the bravery and the willingness of this very feminine woman who bore the image of God in her femininity displayed that invitational receptive nature of God and did something so powerful for us. She carried the life of Jesus in her womb so that he could display the incarnational nature of God and break into our world, but he couldn't have done it without her. He chose to do it with her. You see some of the other attributes, some of the, the, the men and some of the women in scripture, I challenge you to go and look at them and see the ways that God displays these attributes in them and go to the Lord and ask him to bring conviction and revelation to the ways that he has uniquely created you, male and female, to display his image. Because every single one of you in this room bear that same calling. And we need us all showing up in it. Amen? All right. We're going to transition for a minute because I want to talk about transformation. See, I needed to understand what my calling was. I needed to understand what God's purpose for sexuality was when I began walking through this discipleship process to transform my life. For those who heard a bit of my testimony, I struggled with, with homosexuality as a kid. My first relationship was with a guy. I was living a double life. I was in a sexual relationship at 19 years old for about six months. I left that relationship. I got felt convicted by the Holy Spirit finally got the bravery to leave it behind. And then after two years, started actually being honest about my struggle and actively trying to disciple my way through it. But I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what the goal was. So you can imagine trying to figure out what is the goal of this was really important for me. Because without a goal, what, what is this change gonna look like? What is transformation gonna look like? One thing I did have as a target is I wanted to resemble Jesus. So I know from the word of God that we are conformed into the image of Christ from glory to glory to glory. We know that transformation is in part that, right? Right? Christ. I like you so much. <laughs> so I began to try to pursue resembling Jesus. So vague, so big so difficult. And there were things in my life that were very resistant to this process. How many of you have experienced resistance to discipleship and becoming like Jesus in your life? Yes, you all have. If you haven't raised your hand, you're either pissed off that you're here or you're not listening or you're just lying. I don't know, whatever. We all experience resistance to this, and there's a number of reasons why transformation can be so hard. One of the reasons why transformation can be hard is because we face things that are unchangeable in our life. I can't change my history. I can't change my family of origin. I can't change the fact that I was sexually abused. I can't change the fact that I was physically abused. I can't change the fact that I was spiritually abused. I can't change the fact that I was abandoned by both of my parents when I was eight years old. I can't change the fact that I was sexually molested by my brother's girlfriend. I can't change the fact that I got involved in a gay relationship. And I can't remove all those memories from my mind because Jesus cleanses me from my guilt and my shame and my sin, not my humanity and not my memory and not my history. Those things are permanent. You know what else is permanent? I am five foot something. <laughs> on a good day, I say eight, but you all know I'm lying. <laughs> on an honest day, I say six, but it's probably more like seven, but I don't know because it's five, six to eight. And so I'm, it's, it's, it, uh, I have a five foot one wife, so I can feel tall for a minute. That's what is good. I can't change my height, I can't change my family of origin, I can't change my history, but I can change my attitude towards those things. I can change my perspective. Like I said to you before, when I had this revelation that biblical masculinity didn't have anything to do with culture, 
Do you know how much permission that gave me to change my perspective on who I was as a man? Rather than looking at all the places where I feel like I didn't measure up, my perspective shifted to say, no, God, you made me on purpose for a purpose. I am a good man. How do I live that out? I had to change my perspective. You know, for the abuse and the issues that I faced in my life, well-meaning Christians said things to me like, you know, God purposed for you to experience those struggles so that you would have a good testimony for him. Have you ever been told that before? Anyone ever been told something that God, or, or at least God was happy to then use the pain and awful things that happened to you for his glory? Because the only way he can be glorified is in our pain somehow. I got to change my perspective about it, that God didn't purpose the things that hurt me. Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. The scripture does not say that all things are good or that God purposes all those things to happen. It just says that he can take those things in his sovereignty and make them good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. I got to change my perspective. I didn't have to any longer be happy about the abuse that I experienced because now I have a testimony. I got to instead say, God, this was never your heart for me. But thank God your heart is redemptive. And whatever the enemy has meant to destroy me, you can transform for my good, for your glory, and for my benefit. Only God can do that. Transformation, when we run into these places that are permanent, we have to change our, our perspective and our attitude towards them. I can never get rid of the memories of what I've done. When I first got married to my wife, Suzanne, and I had the privilege of being able to have sex with my wife, I thought, I've arrived, everything's good. And then we started having sex. And it was great, actually, <laughs> for like the first two months. And then when we started to have sex, all the memories of what I had done with my boyfriend started coming up because the feelings and the activity were triggering those memories. I can't do anything about my history, but I can change my perspective and my reaction to my history. Now in the past, those memories would come up and I would probably view my life through a lens of failure. I'm being tempted homosexually. This is coming up in my life. This is about who I am. And God was very clear to say, no, you're just reaping the consequences of what you've sown. These are weeds you've planted in the garden of your heart and your mind. And my word says, God cannot be mocked. Whatever a man sows, he reaps. This is just part of that. But you know what, Drew? You get to pull those weeds as they come up. And in partnership with your wife, humble yourself before her and invite me into your bedroom. And in those moments when those memories come up, don't let a third person into your bed unless it's me. So my wife and I began to stop in the middle of sex when these things would happen. And do you know how humiliating and how embarrassing and how humbling it was to say, sweetheart, we have to stop because my memories of, of my boyfriend are coming up and I don't want this in our marriage. And because my wife is the best person in the world, she partnered with me in prayer as we in prayer, pulled those weeds out of the garden of my heart and my mind and gave them back to Jesus. Yes, God, I did this. I planted this seed. I did the deed. But you have redeemed my life. And I want you to take this from me. You have the authority over this. I don't want it in my marriage. I don't want it in my sexual life. Take it. We had to do this for two years. It sucked. And then after I was done with that process, because God was gracious, but there was still work to do, memories of my wife's sexual abuse came up. And we did the same thing for her. Because she can't change her history. She didn't get to decide what happened to her. But we do get to decide how we engage with it, with the Lord for healing and redemption. For four years of our married life, almost at least every other time we had sex, we had to stop. It wasn't fun. It wasn't 
ideal. But sexual sin affects us differently than other sin. It sins against our body. And primarily the, the biggest organ it sins against is our mind and our memory. And we had to walk through the process of changing our attitude towards our histories and surrendering them to Jesus. And after four years, I'm happy to say, we don't have to do that anymore. That part of our lives has transformed. Jesus has brought healing. Is that change? Yes, it is. Sometimes when we, when we are facing transformation and we're trying to walk into this, we have to deal with fear. Fear has a tendency to paralyze us and to shut us down. But paralysis and fear gets undone by a dynamic encounter. And we have these moments in our relationship with God where as we pursue transformation, we need him to bring revelation and a word to us. Back when I was uh, just in the midst, the very beginning of, of all this, and I write about this in my book, I was working, my job was to do the opening shift of, at an athletic club in my hometown. I had to be at the athletic club at 4 a.m. every morning. I know, right? Ungodly hour, only the devil is awake at that time. And, you know, the club wouldn't open until five, so I had a good hour in this place where I was all by myself. I'm an extreme extrovert. I like to be with people. I was forced by the Lord to be alone for a full hour in the morning in the dark. I had a lot of time to pray, very spirited prayers to the Lord during that time. And of course, after I was done with the tasks, I would get to the front desk and I would start checking people into the club. And of course, in that time, I was so incredibly insecure about my identity and my gender. And I, you know, as a short guy, scrawny guy, not athletic, and I would have a parade of specimens of perfect masculinity walking in every morning. Hey, Drew. I'm like, hey, I hate you. You know, it's like, you know, I just felt super insecure. And I started getting pretty frustrated at the Lord of like, God, could you have gotten me a job like, I don't know, somewhere where I didn't have to be confronted with perfection every day. And these images of men that I, of course, in the past have cultivated a lustful response to, but now I'm trying not to, but you're marching them through every morning. And not only do I have to say, don't lust that, I have to also say, don't hate yourself because you're not that. And stop wondering if you'll ever be comfortable in your own skin. So this was my daily struggle. Of course, after that first round of people came in the club, there was about an hour and a half where no one came in because people are weird. So there's like a crew at 5 a.m. and then there's the same people that come at seven. The 5 a.m. crew, I don't know about them. But I had that like almost two hour time period after they all checked in to just sit. And this, this front desk had right over here, full wall of this athletic club was ceiling to floor windows that face the east. And so every morning after this litany of people would come in, I would turn, I would pick up my book and I would read as the sun was coming up. It's actually really beautiful. A nice way to start the day after all that shame. And I remember one time in prayer as I was praying um, while sitting there with my book, I thought, God, when are you gonna change this in me? Like it's been two years since I surrendered the relationship I'm, I'm doing my level best to try to follow you and I don't feel any different. Every day is a struggle to not fall into temptation and lust and pornography and fantasy and masturbation and all these less severe sins and going out and having sex with someone. I'm struggling with all of these and I hate my life and I hate who I am. When are you gonna show up and change me? Anyone ever feel like that before? I needed to have an, a, a dynamic encounter with the Lord because I was stuck in fear and frustration and anger and paralysis. I wasn't moving anywhere. And it was probably after like maybe several weeks of this constant prayer that I you know, had one of those times where I was yelling at God internally and then I stopped. And again, God was doing his containment thing for me because he wasn't threatened by my accusations or my anger or my frustration. God knew the plan, he was fine. And I remember sitting there and he said to me, 
into my, you know, just spoke to my spirit. Drew, do you remember the sun coming up? And it was probably about eight o'clock in the morning and the sun was up. I'm like, no. And he goes, okay, I want you to watch tomorrow for the sun to come up. I said, okay. So the next day I'm doing my thing, watching, people are coming in, watching. And then I had to do something over here. And while I was looking over here, the sun came up and I was like, dang it. Because I could see the light hitting the wall. And you know what? This happened for like three weeks. That every morning for three weeks as I'm trying to like look, I get distracted this way and then the sun comes up and I'm like ticked because the Lord has told me to watch the sun rise and I can't see it happening. So finally, after about three weeks, there was a day. People come in, hi, check in. Drew, what are you doing? I'm busy. And I'm watching it. (laughs) Thank you for that. (laughs) And the sun breaks the horizon and it's beautiful. And I'm like, finally, I've seen it. Now what, Lord? Because, you know, there's a sunrise. I've seen it before. And he said to me, when did it go from dark to light? And I sat there for a second, staring at the sun, which was a bad idea. And I'm like, when did it go from dark to light? Okay, when did it go from dark to light? And I thought about it. I'm like, well, it wasn't, it was getting lighter all the time. There wasn't a single moment when the light overcame the dark. Yeah, there was that moment of breakthrough where the sun broke the horizon. It was glorious. But the entire time, the light was being busy overcoming the darkness incrementally, almost imperceivably. Do you know that the sun rises at the same rate that our pupils begin to dilate and receive light? Because God designed both that he designed it in such a perfect, non-offensive way that when we're just experiencing the sun come up, it doesn't assault our senses because he designed it to complement it. And as I'm sitting there watching this and thinking about this, I'm like, there wasn't a, a single moment, Lord. The light was overcoming the dark for the last several hours. Like it was busy doing that the entire time before the sun broke the horizon. He's like, yeah, that's how change happens, Drew. You're submitting your life to Jesus and you might not see the change breakthrough yet. But the more you surrender your life to me, the more I am busy overcoming the darkness in your life. Bit by bit, moment by moment. There will be a moment where you'll see the breakthrough and you'll see the tangible evidence of that. You'll see the light on the back wall. You'll see the the sun break the horizon. It'll be beautiful. You'll celebrate it. But don't think for a minute, that's the moment that I showed up. I've been here the whole time. Can I encourage you that if you are struggling with something and you don't see the breakthrough yet, yet is a very important word. As we walk with Jesus, he is constantly, constantly transforming our life. And a lot of it might be under the surface and we might not be able to perceive it. But there, is, there comes this day with whatever struggle it is, this day where maybe if it's your thought life, where you realize one day, I didn't have a wicked, lustful, awful thought all day long. And you think, are they still there? And you go looking for them. And you're like, they are. Whoops. Okay, maybe I shouldn't search for them. You know, it's like, (laughs) or maybe if you've done this on a physical level, if you've like been a person who needs to or wants to transform your body, you lose weight. You know, the first time you exercise, we all know this, right? It's not just me that you exercise once. You're like, I'm going to go to the scale real quick. And it's like, But we also know that those small incremental changes, although we might not see the difference, there there comes a day when you're like, wait a minute, I feel different. Wait a minute, my pants are loose. Like, wait a minute. And And it happens this way with everything that we pursue in transformation and growth. It happens incrementally over time. It's the process of sanctification. It's the process of transformation where we are transformed into the image of God from glory to glory to glory to glory. And what is the promise in scripture? That he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. 
So I began to understand in that moment, it was like this revelation of like, God, you are changing me. And even from that moment and that day when I'm like having this revelation that there will be the moment where I feel secure in my, in my gender and it'll be a aha moment, which happened on the plane. I was already married with kids. God was on, he was true. He was every step of the way was leading me to the point where I could go, I no longer feel insecure as a man. The dawn has broken on that. The light has overcome the darkness. I can put that to bed. That's different in me now. That makes sense? Conditioning is another thing that makes transformation hard. Conditioning is our belief systems. We have so much conditioning in our culture when it comes to sexuality, gender, uh, orientation, all these things. One thing that is conditioned in us to believe is that sexual orientation is inborn and immutable because culture keeps telling us that. Would you agree? Also something culture tells us is that it's harmful and damaging and it puts you at risk for suicide and rejection and, and personal damage if you try to address these issues in your life. Have you heard that? Have you heard if you do not allow the transgender individual to transition their gender, you put them at risk for suicide and an early death? Have we heard that? All of these things condition our mind against transformation and against discipleship. And if we believe them and partner with them, we will be ruled by them. Conditioning and belief requires that we replace the belief or that we find a better truth, a greater authority to dethrone that one and put this one in its place. Can I help you by this? There was a gigantic genetic study that was done and the results of which have just been published over the last year on the biological genetic contributors to sexual orientation and gender identity. And the overwhelming consistent scientific evidence states that there is no proof or evidence of a biological or genetic latent immutable root of homosexuality or transgenderism. What this means is there might be things in our biology that make us maybe vulnerable, but not predisposed to sexual orientation. There is absolutely no genetic cause to homosexuality. That better be Jesus calling. I'm just kidding. <laughs> to homosexuality, to transgenderism, there is no biological cause now, that doesn't mean there's not biological contributors. And let me explain something like that. You know, there are, there are things in this world. We live in a fallen world, so we have fallen biology. There's this reality, this genetic disorder called androgen insensitivity syndrome. Androgen insensitivity syndrome affects men, XY chromosome men. And essentially what it is, is that these men cannot process testosterone. From the womb, they cannot process testosterone. So at differentiation in the womb, when testosterone is released to let sexual, dif sexual differentiation occur and the penis to form, their body can't receive it. So even though they're XY chromosome, they are born with what appears to be a vagina. And they present looking like a female. And there is nothing to make a person believe that this isn't a female until adolescence when this person does not have a period. Why is our daughter not having a period? Well, we might want to take her to the doctor and find out. Well, it's because she's actually XY male. Would that cause someone to maybe struggle with their gender identity and orientation? Of course it would. You know, there's this whole culture in, a, in an island, I think it's off of uh, Fiji. I can't exactly remember where it is. It's inconsequential. But in this culture, they have a, a submutation of this disorder that's not as severe. It's partial androgen sensitivity syndrome. And what it essentially does is in utero, it makes male children intolerant to testosterone so they do not develop their penis. Born with what looks like a vagina. But in this culture, they know that they carry this genetic anomaly. 
And so they call this people who experience this penis at 14. That's the translation. Because when puberty hits and secondary sexual characteristics hit, their body has somehow recovered enough to receive the testosterone and to process it. And lo and behold, at adolescence, where there was no penis, now there is one. I do not have a video of this happening, so I don't know what it looks like or how it appears. But I can tell you that these people who experience this, it would be reasonable that they might struggle with their gender identity, correct? They don't. Because it has been so normalized that this is a reality in their culture that they don't worry about this until 14 to decide, am I a boy or a girl? Because this is just one of the realities they have to do. They've changed their attitude towards a permanent thing and it does not allow this thing that is a struggle to define them. Interesting, huh? In fact, with, there's several different disorders that display itself in what's called intersex condition, which is what these might be classified as. The vast majority of people who struggle with intersex condition do not struggle with their gender identity. Let's get to some of the facts about gender identity and transgenderism. And again, the conditioning and beliefs. We've been told that if we do not offer transition for kids who struggle with this issue, that they are more likely to kill themselves, more likely to reject you know, like bad outcomes. But all of the research says this. All of the many, many studies over years and years and years say this. 80 Five to 90% of children who struggle with gender dysphoria will resolve this conflict by the time they turn 18 without any intervention at all. They will be secure in their biological gender by the time they are 18 if we will just let the process happen. Also, post surgical transsexual people have the highest risk of suicide of any population on earth. 42% of post-surgical transsexual individuals will attempt or complete suicide. The average in the general population is 5%. 19 times more likely to attempt suicide post-surgical transsexuals. Because the narrative we've been told fixes and heals people doesn't. And what we've been told harms and hurts people doesn't. We have to change what we're listening to and who we're giving authority to. Does that make sense? Conditioning works like this. I was told and taught by my church that by very nature of the fact that I struggled with same-sex attraction, that I was sinning. That temptation made me a sinner. No other sin is looked at like that in the church. We know Jesus was tempted and was without sin. We know theologically sin and temptation are not the same thing. Temptation can give birth to sin, but temptation itself is not the problem. It's what you do with it that's the problem. But in my mind, by virtue of the fact that I had this temptation, I was guilty and sinful and wrong. How is a person going to pursue Jesus and find victory over sin if they are guilty and condemned before they ever have a chance to respond? If you're guilty before you even try to resist, you are set up to fail immediately. How unfair is that? Like all of you in this room, if you do not struggle with this, if you do not, if you've not been told this, if you struggle heterosexually, men in the room, if you look at a woman and you're like, she pretty, you have a choice. You can say, she is pretty. Good job with those genetics, God, and move on. You've not sinned. You just have eyes. Good job, men in the room. Ladies in the room, same thing. You might see a man and go, <laughs> or don't because that's creepy. But 
but you know what I'm saying. You can recognize aesthetic beauty or handsomeness or attractiveness in a person that doesn't make you a sinner, that doesn't make you lusting after the person. You can acknowledge, yeah, they're attractive because I have eyes, I see it, and I know it. And then you submit that to God. Good job, God, I'm moving on. You're not guilty. But I can tell you this, every person that I've ministered to over the last two decades has wrestled with the message they've received from the church by virtue of the fact that you struggle this way, you're guilty. You're an abomination. You are despised by God. If that is what we believe, how do we ever believe that God would receive us if we ran to him for help? I can't run to the throne of grace in my time of need if I believe God hates me or is already judging me for virtue of my vulnerability. When I changed my perspective, particularly on the issue of attraction, when I began to see guys that were attractive and handsome, just simply recognizing that used to convict me. I was in a sporting goods store with one of my best friends. This guy is like the polar opposite of me. You see me, you see what I look like. Hobbit. This guy is a six foot five, tall, dark, and handsome college basketball player and personal trainer. You could not get more odd couple than the two of us. Like this guy, he has no shred of same-sex attraction, homosexual orientation at all in him. He's an incredible guy. He was, he's my best friend. He was the best man at my wedding. We are still best friends after 25 years. I love this guy. This guy did so much to help heal my heart. And one of the things that he did in this sporting goods store, we were getting ready to go on a mission trip. We needed bathing suits. We were going to the bathing suit section. There was a big poster advertising the bathing suits. And who do they put on those pictures? It's not Chris Farley. <laughs> I saw the perfectly proportioned Mostly naked man in a bathing suit. I recognized that he was handsome and I felt condemned. And the enemy was like, see, you've not changed one bit. You're guilty, you're awful, you're gay. And I felt really defeated. Of course, I didn't say anything. I just internally had that shame cycle going on. And then I heard something very strange. My very straight friend said, that guy's ripped. And I went, what? I, I went, excuse me? And he said, the guy in the advertisement. I mean, look at him. I'm like, I'm trying not to. But I, I went, you see that? And my friend said in only the way that he can, he goes, Drew, what do you think I see when I look at men? Bean bags? You know, I'm like, He's not a blob, like, he's got a 14-pack, you know, it's like, I can see that. You can crack a walnut with those pecs, you know, it's like, I'm like, you see that? And he's like, yes, I have eyes. And then it clicked for me, like, him seeing that did not make him gay. It meant he had eyes. That he could look at that and go, yeah, that guy's in shape and he didn't threaten his identity, and he didn't condemn him. Maybe I can recognize there's beauty out there too without feeling guilty or wrong or defiled. Maybe I can make the decision to go, yep. Good job, God. <laughs> Bye-bye. Do you know how much it changed my reactions? That it gave me permission when I felt an attraction to stop and go, what is going on in my heart right now? Because it wasn't always, you know, the display of the guy. It, it might have been just a guy that I knew and I was interacting with him and something stirred in me and I'm like, why am I drawn to this person? I didn't naturally assume anymore that it was sexual attraction or sin. Because you know what? Not all attraction is sexual. Why do you make the friends you make? Because you're attracted to them. You might not want to sleep with them. Maybe you just admire them. Maybe they have qualities that are admirable and good that you want to rub off on you. You know, there's a lot of people I'm attracted to. I really love intelligent people. I want to glean from their knowledge and their understanding. I want to, I want to get from them what I don't have. 
And I believe that that's biblical. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So if I see someone who's intellectually brilliant and creative and amazing, and I am drawn to that, it's not because I'm gay. It's because it's admirable. And it's good and right to acknowledge things that are admirable. And so I might see that and go, okay, God, I have the opportunity to evaluate what's happening in my head. But without that permission, do you know where my mind would go? Well, this means that I'm gay and I'm a failure and I must be lusting after them. Is this making any sense to anybody? It gave me so much permission to go to God for understanding of what was going on in my heart and mind. And it's so amazing to me that when we get to do that and God begins to change the condition of our mind and he begins to allow us to see different things that are at play in the, the motivations of our heart and how we relate to people, it began to transform my relationships because I wasn't afraid of people that were attractive to me because I could appreciate why this person is super funny. They're a hoot. Oh, for fun, I can be your friend. This person is super intelligent. I want to learn from you. This person, you know, this person is just, you know, friendly. This person knows how to build things and I don't. I don't want to be their friend. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it, it just gave me the ability to discern and to wrestle out what was I thinking and what was I feeling. And it took the power and authority away from the enemy to tell me what I was thinking and feeling. Does that make sense? When we deal with the conditioning or beliefs, when we start questioning what we've been taught and we start submitting those thoughts and those, those, those places of conviction or those places of stronghold in our lives to the Lordship of Christ, he begins to transform them and suddenly all this possibility comes up. And before when we would have been stuck and limited in our understanding, now God gives us a wide open field to begin to dream, what might you do with me? because you can transform anything and I don't have to feel guilty or wrong for just being me. Because one of the things that stops us from growing and changing is no vision or dream for the future. And you can't have vision or dream for something different if what you think you have currently is permanent and unchanging. I'll be honest with you, it's one of the reasons why I really do not get behind anybody who calls himself a believer in Jesus claiming any identity above son or daughter. So when people say, I'm a gay Christian, but I'm celibate, I understand what they're saying and I understand why they're saying it. But my challenge to them would be, by saying this is who you are, you're saying it's unchangeable. You're taking authority away from God to have permission to do whatever he wants in your life as you submit it to him. You're holding back. And God does not want just one attribute of our life, just one section of our life. He wants it all. He wants the authority to speak to and direct and lead all of it. And if we believe something is unchanging, we will have no dream or vision for different. And quite honestly, there is nothing in this world that we experience that God can't transform and repurpose. Amen? All right, so in all of this, I do wanna say this because I think that there's so much in our world that points back to this and then we're gonna to get to some question and answer. My life was radically transformed and it's been being radically transformed for the last 25 years as I've been submitting my life to Jesus. I am wildly different than I was 25 years ago. Do you know people thought I was an introvert? I don't know how that's possible. Except for that before I had such a low view of myself and such a low view of my value, I wouldn't talk to people because I felt like, what's the point? I have nothing to offer. I felt so disabled in relationship and so afraid of rejection that I didn't want to engage with people because I didn't want to be rejected. And so I kept away and I kept silent and I kept less. That's one thing that's profoundly changed in me. I was addicted to sexual behaviors, pornography, 
fantasy, even though I gave up the relationship with my boyfriend and never had another relationship physically with another man, you would better believe I cultivated fantasy and memory of that encounter for years. Because for me, that was one of the most powerful experiences of being accepted and loved. And I left it for a lot of nothing for a long time. And in the vulnerability of my own heart, and in the vulnerability of my humanity, at times when I felt lonely and rejected, it was really easy to pull up the file of the memory of those encounters and when I was held and when I was loved and when I was wanted and to replay that through fantasy and masturbation. I fell down in my heart and mind a lot. I was addicted. I am not addicted and I don't practice those behaviors anymore. Is that different? than where I was. Yes. Have I changed? Yes. I do not deal with intrusive thoughts in my life. If I see an attractive person, male or female, I do not lust after them. Here's another interesting perspective that shifted. I disqualified myself from transformation because I thought that what I was going to experience for a woman if I was transformed was gonna be the same as what I felt for a man. What I felt for a man was based in lust and a need to complete myself. God did not rescue me from that to trade one lust struggle for another. And quite honestly, a lot of the men I was looking to for examples of what healthy masculinity and healthy sexuality looked like did not spend enough time in their own life to realize that they were also pursuing females to try to complete them and give them value. And it was self-serving and it was infatuation. And often these marriages were based on those two things and sometimes lust, which is why after a few years, it wasn't that fulfilling anymore because that woman proved to not be able to fulfill, complete, or heal him. And his motivation was mostly broken anyway. And so as I was looking around to the men around me going, what is healthy? Not too many people were displaying it. And so when I met my wife and I felt feelings for her for the first time as a 24-year-old man thinking it is really unfair to have to go through puberty twice in one lifetime, as a joke. Yeah. <laughs> and my draw to her was because I saw in her compassion and empathy and understanding and servanthood and this incredible heart, this incredible love for people. And by the way, she was real pretty and she was five foot one, which made me feel really tall, which was really important. <laughs> Felt like a man. <laughs> and when I began to get to know her, my desire for her was, I want to know you for my whole life. One day before I even really knew too much about her, I was hanging out with some friends at my brother's house. Um, we were watching Survivor. It's what we did back then. Had dinner and watched Survivor. Then a bunch of them decided to go off to a worship team practice. I was left there with a mountain of dishes and a few other people who were staying to watch whatever was on after Survivor. I just got up and started going doing the dishes. This is what I do. I'm servant-hearted. Make me a servant. You know, as I'm doing the dishes, I was just thinking, here's my lot in life. Up came this girl, no words, stood right next to me, didn't say a word, just started doing dishes with me. And her arm brushed up against mine, and I almost fell over. <laughs> and I thought, what is this feeling so sudden and new? You know, I did not do that. I sat there and I turned and she didn't need an invitation. She didn't need permission. Her heart was to serve. And as we sat there kind of in silence doing the dishes together, this thought popped into my head, which I had no idea where it came from. And it shocked me and it scared me a little bit. And the thought was this, I wonder if she would want to do dishes with me for the rest of our lives. And I thought, holy crap, what is happening to me? What I have with Suzanne is so incredibly good. It's so incredibly life-giving to me. I love her so much. She's my best friend. She's my partner in crime. She's my favorite person. She doesn't complete me. Jesus does. 
my love for her, I get to give to her as an overflow of the love that he gives to me. I don't need anything from her. She doesn't need anything from me. Our purpose and our goal in our marriage is to outbless each other, to outgive love to each other. There was one time in our marriage where we approached marital intimacy and, and sexual like, intimacy from a selfish place. Both of us were in a real bad mood. I don't know if any of you married couples can relate to just wanting to just enjoy your evening and be a little satisfied by this, but can I tell you sex, selfish sex is never as good as self-giving and mutual love. And it was maybe five minutes into it where we both looked at each other and said, we need to knock this off and stop because this is stupid. This is not satisfying. And then we laughed about the fact that this was so bad <laughs> because that didn't make me feel insecure because I don't need her to complete me or heal me. And she doesn't need me to complete or heal her. We have Jesus for that. We get to encourage each other. We get to support one another. We get to root each other on. We get to love each other selflessly and lavishly. I love her so much. And the life that I have with her, I wouldn't trade for anything on this earth. Has my life changed? Yes, profoundly. Could I go back? Yes, any one of us could. Here's the reality about transformation. God has given us the physical to understand the spiritual and the emotional and the relational, right? How many of you have ever seen the show, The Biggest Loser? Raise your hand if you've seen it. In this show, older show, I don't think they do it anymore because it wasn't that healthy. They put a bunch of people who struggle with their weight in a like, group together. They're there for like three months and the goal is to lose weight and get in shape. And if you've ever seen the show, you recognize, yes, diet and exercise, big part of this, but every single one of those people began to confront emotional and trauma issues that got them into this place where food became their drug. And so there are these emotional and relational and even sometimes spiritual things that these people are confronting in their transformation process. And lo and behold, do they lose weight? Yes, they do. Hundreds of pounds they lose. Their bodies are transformed and every single one of them seem to say the same thing. I am never going back to that way of life that was killing me. Never. And then they do. A high percentage of them do. Because transformation, we're not, we're not static creations. We are constantly moving, either moving towards something or moving away from it. We do not remain, we do not get to a place of transformation and just camp there. If you've lost a bunch of weight and you got in great shape and you decide, I've made it, and the couch and Netflix, what is going to happen? You're going to gain it all back, you're going to fit into bad patterns again, and you're going to cultivate and sow seeds of lazy and unhealth, and you're gonna reap those consequences. When someone like me shares my testimony publicly, and it's getting, it's getting more and more intense for people like me, who share from the perspective I share. Because in our world, there's been many people who've claimed this identity, there's been organizations who claimed this testimony, and they failed. Several people who were on billboards, worked for Focus on the Family, worked for organizations, were the poster children for this transformational reality are now back in the gay lifestyle and saying it was never real to begin with. So many people look at me when I share my testimony and think, yeah, right. And I'll be honest with you, I don't like sharing about my relationship with Suzanne, honestly, to crowds of people because it's vulnerable for me because I don't know too many other married couples who have to actually go through some of the details of their sexual life in order to prove to you that they are actually who they are. I have to. And I have to deal with this reality that if I do not continue to pursue Jesus and maintain the things that he has taught me that have led me into life and health, I could destroy my marriage and my life 
anyone could. Transformation is not a one-way street. All the science currently on sexual orientation recognize the fluidity and the continuum of sexual expression, orientation, behavior. Why? Because we reap what we sow. And if we cultivate a life of lust, we reap the consequences of that. If we cultivate a life of godliness, we reap the consequences positively of that. Does that make sense? So I want you to hear this for whatever struggle you are facing. God is always at work in your life as you are submitting to him, overcoming whatever darkness it is. Whether you see it or not, he's at work. Continue to pursue him. When you see those breakthrough moments, embrace them and celebrate them and continue to cultivate the things that God has laid in front of you to be healthy, to be strong, to be right, to be displaying his image and continually cultivate it. Because whatever your struggle is, you can go back to it. Because the Israelites wanted to go back to Egypt. We will be tempted to go back. But the transformation we experience when we pursue Christ is real. It's absolutely authentic and real. My life has changed. And I could go back. But I don't have to. And I'm not gonna. <laughs>